Have a seat, folks. Well, today we're talking about doubt, and, and faith, is, as we've been looking at, is taught in the New Testament, is, is trust and dependence on God, and we know, we know God through the person of Jesus Christ. I say this every Sunday. You know, you start talking about God, and it's, that's such a huge subject. You know, a lot of peop, different people talk about God, and that word means just, I mean, it's just huge. What God are we talking about? Well, we're, we're talking about the God that we know through Jesus Christ. And Scripture says that Jesus has explained Him to us. We, we know who God is because of what the Scripture says about Jesus. But today I want us, I want us to bring a little um, description that I've saved just for this, this Sunday. Uh, this is the fifth Sunday in this series. Got one more next week. We're going to talk about waiting but this week, I've, I've saved this passage of Scripture, probably one of the best-known passages of Scripture on faith, and it comes from Hebrews 11.1. 1. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Conviction of things not seen. Did you catch that? Faith isn't certainty, you see. It's conviction of what we don't see. If we see them then it's not about faith. Now, I think it's necessary to get into this subject of doubt because doubt uh, gets a lot of press today in the church and beyond. And, and obviously, if you know, say so we're preaching on doubt, well, everybody's going to say, well, you're preaching about Thomas because everybody thinks about doubting Thomas and uh, disciple who was not with the other disciples when Jesus first... Uh, came and presented himself to them and then you know Thomas became rather famous as doubting Thomas and and they they told Thomas they said we've seen the Lord and he said well and, and unless you know I, I see his hands and and the marks of the nail and I, I put my hand into the wound on his side I, I will never believe is what he tells them so we go oh he's a doubter and we I think that Thomas has gotten a bad rep for that um, the story is, John tells it, really isn't that negative about Thomas. In fact, you, you stop to think about this. You've got ten disciples. Judas is dead. Thomas is missing. You've got ten disciples who are uh, held up in this room, locked because of fear. And they tell Thomas, and they're not expecting resurrection, and they tell Thomas, we've seen the Lord. He's raised. And he's looking at these guys and, I mean, he knows these ten disciples really well, and they vacillated in their faith a lot. It just wasn't that long ago that they were arguing as to which one of them was the greatest. <laughs> and Thomas looks at them and goes, you know, I'm not going to take it secondhand. I, I, you guys just can't tell me, and I believe you. I've got to see it firsthand. I want the evidence. I want to see the Lord. And so unless I see the marks, you know, I'm, I'm not going to believe. And Thomas has some reservations. And he's not a guy that's just going to say, well, I believe because I want to be part of the group. Okay, I want to be like everybody else. But he's a guy who is so intense about his faith that he wants to see. And then the next week, uh, Jesus uh, comes back again and, you know, shows Thomas who he is. And, and Thomas you know, puts his hands in the marks and then he says, my Lord and my God. And he has this great faith, this great belief. And Jesus says to him, he says, have you believed because you've seen me? He says, blessed are those who have not seen and will believe. So in that he's talking to us. We don't get the privilege of placing our hands in the physical body of the resurrected Jesus. Now, we could talk about Thomas and his uncertainty and his desire to see and touch, but I've chosen another man, uh, John the Baptist, or really John the Baptizer is technically who he is. He wasn't really uh, a Baptist like we think of Baptist today, okay? But he's John the Baptizer is who he is. And this isn't the same John that wrote the gospel. This is uh, 
close relative of Jesus. He was, he was born as the last prophet of the Old Testament. And he had the purpose in life of making the way for the Messiah, of preparing the Hebrew people for the coming of the Messiah, for the day of the Lord and, and this coming King. And I mean, John's just this great man of faith. He was, he was born to a priest and his wife late, late in their life and just kind of a miraculous birth. And it says that in the womb, he was filled with the Spirit. Uh, so that just shows you how God has chosen him for this special purpose. And his, his dedication to God is just without question. I mean, he took the vow of a Nazarite, which means that you were set apart to seek holiness all your life. And you were known by everybody else by the way that you look. As, if you took the vow of a Nazarite, you didn't cut your hair. You, you wouldn't drink wine. Wine was... Uh, and that was rough in their day because, you know, the, the way that you would preserve any kind of liquid was by fermenting. That was the only means that they had. So he would abstain from wine. Uh, he didn't live in the villages with the other people. It says that he lived out in the desert. And he wore a camel's hair coat, which might kind of miss us. It's symbolic to make him a prophet. But camel's hair is really scratchy. So... So John, the baptizer, goes through life, you know, like this all the time. You know, it's, it's like you just, you know, got a haircut and the hair stuck in your T-shirt or something. That's what John the Baptist has to go through. And, and, and then it says that his diet was locusts. And locusts can be any kind of swarming insect, but, you know, we think of grasshoppers. So we've got a guy with long hair wearing a scratchy coat eating grasshoppers. And it says, and wild honey so he doesn't go down you know to his local store and, and buy the honey he gets it wild so picture for yourself this man in his 30s he's got really long scraggly hair okay he's scratching a lot and he's got you know bee stings all over him and that's that's john the baptist that's who this is and he's he's living out in the wilderness his entire life, he lived for God. He baptized Jesus. He, he said, I'm here to prepare a way for him. And I've got to decrease so he can increase. And he knew Jesus. He's from the same family. Okay, Their, their mothers were, were relatives. And he also lived his entire life just directing people, uh, getting, the, getting the Hebrews ready to receive this new Messiah and this new king. And remember, he's the one who saw Jesus and said, here comes the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. But John kind of ran into a messy situation. King Herod uh, was having an affair with his sister-in-law. And John, I don't know, posted on Facebook about it or did something, called him out on it. And no doubt Herod said, hey, it's no big deal, you know, John. It's, it's just sex. It's no big deal. Uh, everybody's doing that, and uh, nobody's perfect, doesn't hurt anyone. But John ends up in jail over the whole thing. And while he's there in prison, uh, he begins to think about Jesus as the Messiah. And he has this interesting question. And this is in the account from Matthew 11, beginning with verse 2. When Jesus had finished instructing his 12 disciples, he went on from there to teach and preach in their cities. Now when John heard in prison about the deeds of the Christ, he sent word by his disciples and said to him, Are you the one who has come, or shall we look for another? And Jesus answered them, Go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, and the poor have good news preached to them. And blessed is the one who is not offended by me. So John the Baptist, sitting in prison, has some questions. You know, about Jesus. Somebody might call these doubts that he has. And, you know, doubt is kind of a loaded word, especially in the church. Uh, Doubt to some means that you have no faith at all, that you're a skeptic or a cynic and you just don't want to believe. And there's some reasons for that. 
Uh, Jesus said one time, he said that if you would pray and not have doubt, that it would happen. Uh, John 21, 21, he said that. So if you would pray without doubt that, you know, he said the, the mountain could be cast into the sea. And then James in the first uh, chapter of James 6, verse talks about asking without doubt when you, when you pray. And when doubt is used in those references, it doesn't mean uncertainty or even that we have questions, but it refers to vacillating, to changing your mind a lot, of being of two minds. And James goes on to say that people that doubt like that, that ask God but ask in doubt, are double-minded, you know. And so this is prayer that is not done in faith or trusting in God's promises, but rather it's just kind of testing God. So this is the person who says, well, we can pray it can hurt anything. All right, let's see what happens. Let's just pray and see, see what happens in this situation. And when we come to God like that, kind of like, well, you know, maybe he might do something. Then, you know, we have no faith and we have a wish, we have a desire, but that's not trust, that's not faith. And faith means that we depend upon him. It's a firm conviction. Now, that's not the way that I'm using the word doubt today. So I just wanted to make sure there's no misunderstanding. I'm using doubt to mean uncertainty or questions. Uncertainty or questions are always part of our faith relationship with God because, I mean, we are mere humans, and part of the job description of God is that He is that which greater than cannot be conceived. He is always beyond what we can know or even imagine. And that's what makes him God. And that what makes us human beings is that we are finite and we cannot conceive of him and that greatness. And always we have questions. Um, we have some absolute, uh, we lack absolute certainty about God. And that's, that's the case for, for every person. So John is ready in this, this time to die for God, but he, but he still has questions about Jesus. I mean, are you the Messiah? I mean, you're not acting like what I thought the Messiah was going to act. You're not doing the things that I thought the Messiah was going to do. And my expectations for the Messiah are different than what you are doing. So should I look for someone else? And John still trusted. He still believed in God but he's not sure that Jesus is the Messiah. So Jesus sent a message back and he said to give John the proof of who I am based on what I've done. And what he told him comes from a prophecy in Isaiah 61.1. It's the same verse that Jesus used, the first sermon that he preached when he picked up the book of Isaiah and read from it. And it's that, that whole account is in Luke 4. And he, he read those verses uh, and then he sat down. He says, today this scripture has been fulfilled. I am the Messiah. I am the Christ. And the, the, the way that uh, Jesus gives this verse to John, he says, the blind receive their sight, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, deaf hear, the dead are raised up, the poor have good news preached to them. That all comes from Isaiah 61, prophecies about the Messiah, except... Uh, Jesus left out one little part of that verse, and that was the part about the prisoners being set free. And, and that's uh, it's kind of a little nuance, kind of ironic here. He, he doesn't tell John that the prisoners are going to be set free because John's in prison, and John's not going to be set free. Eventually, John has his head cut off is what happens to him. And it's no different today. If we have questions, there's room in our faith for development there's room for questions to live and there's it's there that that we actually seek God the most is when we have some questions about how things are and God I don't understand why this is happening I don't understand Jesus and would you teach me my preacher when I was a young man in faith and my mentor for uh, quite a few years uh, Jim as you hear me talk about him had a Bible. I, my Bible's just like Jim's. I imitated him, but it has a wide margin. 
And Jim used to show me his Bible, and he had all kinds of notes written in the margins. And then every once in a while, he would have a question mark, and he would put the question mark in in pencil because it was something that he didn't understand. And so he would say, when I don't understand something in the Bible, I write it in a question mark in pencil. He says, every once in a while, I get to erase one of those, get to erase a question mark. So here was a man that I admired very much who early on in my Christian life taught me that it's okay to have questions. It's okay to not think that you can understand everything that God does or says. Billy Graham at age 90 was asked about death. If at death, if God would say to him, well done, good and faithful servant. And uh, the reporter said that Billy Graham paused for a, a long while and then he answered and he said, I hope so. It's Billy Graham. I hope so. See, he doesn't have absolute certainty but he has hope in that day. And certainty lives alongside of faith. We, we want to believe. And, and our problem is today, especially, is that we live in a time when skepticism is honored and revered and distrust is celebrated today. There are millions today who do not want to believe. And we now have evangelistic atheists in our midst. Uh, billboard campaigns like this one, and millions are being spent to convince you that faith is, is irrational. That's why you shouldn't have faith because it's just silly and it doesn't make sense. And Christians who have convictions are now depicted as weak and illogical. And to distrust revealed truth is now promoted and advanced as this is what it means to be intellectual. This is what it means to be tolerant, is to be skeptical of God. And the church sometimes, I think, actually kind of adds into this, has not helped this uh, by being so dogmatic on some things and actually, you know, criticizing people who voice their questions. And it's, you're just supposed to be quiet and here's what we believe. So take this and memorize this. Sometimes are the Christians, sometimes Christians are the ones who act as though God can't answer the questions by asking why. And uh, the church has become kind of, at times, masters of spin. As Colbert would say, we like truthiness, you know. Uh, we, we kind of like words and phrases that are close to the truth and have a little bit of truth in them, but, but not too clear for someone. But there's a whole generation today at hand that have grown up in this age of skepticism and believe, believe really that that if you have convictions about God, if you have faith in God, that you must not be very smart. Because if you're smart, you will question everything and distrust everyone. And so they, they are being told this. A generation at hand is, is still asking the questions, though, what, what difference does Jesus make? I, I mean, how are we supposed to live? Is there anything worth living for? Is there any such thing as truth today? And often, I think that you can live in the darkness of skepticism so long that when the light comes in, it actually begins to hurt your eyes at first. They've come to believe in skepticism. Skepticism has become the philosophy and their scientific proof that we are alone, we have no home. And skepticism, excuse me, is just a revealing of ignorance, a celebration of darkness. And sadly, that's packaged as good logic, rational thinking. The skeptical person who denounces all convictions is elevated as a thinker because they say that there is no such thing as truth. And the person that has convictions and faith, well, they're, they're depicted as being someone that is a very small thinker, a, you know, a very illogical person. But you know, I think faith makes more sense in this whole era of logic, I think faith just makes a whole lot of sense. And let me kind of give you an illustration to think about that. Suppose that you're on uh, in, a, in a big building, uh, eight, ten stories high, and it's on fire. 
and the fire down below has collapsed all the stairways and the, the elevator shafts are gone. And you're left up here on the 10th floor of this, of this building and the, the building is burning and there's no way out. And you know, you look down and there's some firemen down there and they've got a blanket. And you know, they're saying jump. And you're wondering, should I jump? And they, they look just a little bit wobbly. Uh, you know, it was the fireman's annual picnic and they've just come from that. And you know, Oktoberfest or whatever. And the, the keg was big and firemen will be firemen. And they're, they're just kind of wobbling around down there. But you, you know, they're saying, we got the blanket, we can catch you. And so you're thinking, okay, what am I going to do here? You know, I, I look down there and I, I think it's, it's probably about, well, maybe a 10% chance that if I jump that they can actually save my life. Okay. And this is how it goes. You think, so I don't want to appear to be stupid and, and be a guy that is naive by trusting them and their 10% chance. You know, I mean, the odds are just too thin. Um, I think I'll choose the fire. Yeah, I'll just stay up here and just choose the fire uh, because the risk of being wrong or having any false assumptions are just too great. Is that logical? To choose to die rather than to risk being wrong? I mean, standing there in that building, maybe we realize that I'm not that great with percentages. Maybe it's 10%, maybe it's 20%, maybe it's 50%. I don't know. I'm not, I'm not really that, that good with percentages. And I, I'm not into calculating stuff. I'm terrible at math. But I do know that I am a survivor. That, that much I do know about myself is that I am a survivor. And there are a lot of things about Jesus maybe that I don't understand. You know, sometimes he says some things that I, I really wish he wouldn't have said some of that stuff. You know, he could have talked all day, as we say, not said that. And I, I don't understand that whole thing about, you know, I'm the only one and there's, there's nobody else and, you know, the road is narrow and wide and all that. You know, I don't get that. I don't understand how the Savior of the world would say something like that. But I'm not very good at calculating my percentages. I'm a survivor. And Jesus, Jesus is a Savior. He says... Trust me. Follow me. I've, I've come to give you life. And the building, the building's burning. I can smell the smoke. I mean, does doubt or faith in that make more sense? See? I think I'll send Jesus a message. Are you, are you the one? And his, his reply he says, well, check it out. I've done everything I promised that I would do. Doubt's not a sin. The relationship between doubt and faith recalls Jesus' statement. He says, who's ever been forgiven little, uh, loves little. And who's ever been forgiven much, loves much. And I think it's the same thing with questions that we have. If we've had some questions... We believe the answers that we get much more than the person that just takes it from someone else and says, what am I supposed to believe? Here it is. Henry Nouwen was a very respected uh, Christian author and professor at Harvard and Yale, and, and he struggled with his faith, especially late in his life. Uh, right before he died, he took a sabbatical and he went of all places to a circus and hung around a circus for a while. Um, there he met the Flying Rodleys, a trapeze group, and got to know them. And what he learned was that in trapeze groups that there are flyers and there are catchers. And the flyer climbs up the platform and grabs the, the trapeze and just kind of jumps off that platform, you know, and goes back and forth, building up momentum. And the catcher on the other side of the circus tent, hangs by his legs with his arms suspended and tries to time himself going back and forth. And of course, the matter of truth comes is when the flyer releases from the trapeze and maybe, you know, a couple flips in the air and he's just falling madly through the air to his death, you know, perhaps. 
And he has uh, absolutely nothing at that time to hold on to. And if he misses, you know, he's probably a goner. And at that moment, you know, it now learns us that every cell in that flyer's body is on fire. He's got adrenaline pumping through him like jet fuel. He's more alive probably than any of us have ever been. And opposite him is the catcher. And the catcher has been timing his arcs perfectly. perfectly. And as, as the flyer reaches the peak and he begins to fall with gravity to descend, and he's blind because it's all going so fast and he can't see anything, it's then that the catcher snatches his arms out of thin air and all is well, and everybody applauds, right? And now I got to know these guys rather well, and he, what he found out was that flyers are very small men, about 150 pounds or less, and catchers don't want flyers who like sweets very much, you know, because it's just not a, not a good thing to do. And, and Rodley, the leader of the group, told now, and he says, as a flyer, I must have complete trust in my catcher, the audience thinks that I'm the star, but I'm not. It's Joe, my catcher. He has to have split-second precision reactions so he can catch me out of the air. Now impressed him some more on the relationship, and Rodley said, he says, I do nothing. He says, I just simply trust that my catcher is always there with his outstretched arms to get me. Well, now on being a Christian author, being a great man of faith, has a point in this, and he says, sometime in life we're all going to have to let go. Everybody has to let go. But we get to choose our catcher. Is Jesus your catcher? Is he at the bottom of the Tim Story building that's burning? Would you jump if it were Jesus down there? Do you trust him? Maybe you're not sure. Maybe you need some more information. Jesus doesn't send a message back to John the Baptist and say, who do you think you are to question me? Jesus sends proof back to John the Baptist to answer his questions. By all means, if you're not sure, don't tell God that you are sure if you're not. You can't fake him out. He knows. He knows. We can't fake faith. Often we have some doubts. Often we have some questions. And questions can be the path. Question can be the path that opens us up to faith. And here's the thing. We can have convictions and questions at the same time. We can say, he's my catcher. I don't understand how he does it. I don't understand everything about it, but I've chosen him as my catcher. And the more that he catches me, the more that I trust him, and the more that I know who he is. Yeah, the conviction of things not seen. As deep cries out 